brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Has Jesus been misquoted? How good are the manuscripts on which the New Testament is based? Some have said that the text has been deliberately changed. We're going to look at the actual texts that survive from antiquity, and we're going to talk to the experts who know best. Join us on our quest for the truth. In 1897, two famous explorers, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt, traveled across Egypt in search of ancient manuscripts. Egypt's dry conditions made it the perfect place for manuscripts to be preserved in the sand for hundreds of years. They wound up going to an Egyptian city about 120 miles down the Nile from modern-day Alexandria, a place called Oxyrhynchus, which literally means city of the sharp-nosed fish. And initially they didn't find anything until someone suggested the old trash heaps, mounds of sand and so forth outside of the city limits. You could probably put most of this ancient dump inside a football field. So they wandered out in amongst these sandy mounds to examine what was there. And one of them noticed a brown leaf sticking out of the sand and he kicked it with his foot and flipped over a page of ancient papyrus. And as luck would have it, it was from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, which today is P1 in our list of papyri. And so began then several seasons of digs. And over the years, some 500,000 pages of papyrus text were recovered. I remember talking in the, in the early 1970s to a woman who was on staff at the British Museum, and when she discovered that I was studying for a PhD in textual criticism, she said, oh, you must come over to London sometime. We have crates of that stuff down in the basement that have never been opened, and it's still the case. Something in the neighborhood of 90 to 95 percent of the material that Grenfell and Hunt acquired in Oxyrhynchus has never been edited or opened. If you want to see biblical manuscripts, but you can only visit one place, Dublin, Ireland is the place to go. The Chester B.T. Library contains one of the most important collections of biblical manuscripts in the world, including the most ancient collection of all four Gospels, Papyrus 45. P45 is dated to about 200 to 250 AD, so the first half of the third century. P45, together with the rest of the collection, was uncovered in the winter of 1929-1930 by a number of local Egyptians. It's not really sure exactly where the manuscripts were uncovered, because when the discovery and the acquisition of these manuscripts was published in the Times, it was sensational, because it moved back the existing understanding of the Christian texts at least 100 years. It really confirmed the soundness of the text as we understood it. And while there are variants, there are variations, there are scribal errors, there isn't anything that was sort of fundamentally shocking to anyone that changed the nature of the understanding of the text. So what that tells us is that the earliest period was uh, not nearly as free or chaotic as, as some scholars have supposed. The other thing though impresses me about P45 is that it dates to the very beginning of the third century. When that text was copied, some of the autographs of the Gospels could well have still been in circulation. So P45 could be a witness then to the originals or at least the earliest copies of the Greek New Testament Gospels. Those earliest copies of the Gospel were found on the writing material Papyrus. Since the earliest manuscripts are on papyrus, 
It helps to understand how it was made and why it lasted so long. Papyrus is made by taking papyrus reeds and a layer of strips that are, let's say, vertical, placing on top of that a, a layer that's horizontal, smashing those together so that the natural juices of the, of the reed combine. When you're writing on papyrus in the ancient world, you often write with the fibers. The recto actually refers to the side of the page where the fibers run horizontally, and the verso refers to the side of the page where the fibers run vertically. And a papyrologist is somebody who studies texts written on papyri, basically. The average sized Greek New Testament manuscript is more than 450 pages long. That's the average size. So we have altogether over 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts, more than two and a half million pages of text. The first form it was written in was on papyrus, which was kind of like ancient paper. And then the second stage was parchment, animal skins that are uh, scraped very, very thin Parchment is the vast majority of our manuscripts. The earliest ones are typically papyrus. The later ones are frequently and then ultimately uh, paper. Our discoveries have not come to an end yet. There's a good chance that we continue to find uh, copies of New Testament texts also in the near future. P66 is the oldest on earth known exemplary of the Gospel of St. John. So it's one of the most extraordinary items that we belong here in the Martin Bodmer Foundation. It's 154 pages and it is the first known codex. This Gospel of St. John, we think, is a document from the year about 200 after Christ. The document is a copy, something hundred years after it was written. All you have are about 14 chapters of the Gospel of John. You have about four to five hundred corrections that are made in this manuscript. Some people say, oh, what a poorly done, careless copyist this was. No, because examination of the corrections show that these corrections are all made by the same hand who made the manuscript. So what it means is it wasn't a careless scribe, he just wasn't very skilled. First time through, he makes lots of errors, but he's obviously very concerned about providing a careful, accurate text. So he goes back and proofs his work and catches about four to 500 errors and diligently corrects them. So that doesn't suggest to me a careless scribe. He just wasn't very skilled at his first attempt, but he was very conscientious. Investigating the earliest fragments of the New Testament requires scholars from all sorts of disciplines. Some study the text of the New Testament, others the materials that the writings were found on. Still others gain insights from the work of the archaeologists who unearth these treasures from the ground. Now we all know what archaeology is. It's a careful digging inch by inch downward, measuring the layers, the strata, and that's why it's called stratigraphy. Well, back in the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th century, there wasn't that care very often. Grinfell and Hunt knew that there was a chance of finding some books gathered together that dated from a certain period of time in a layer that dated from another time. They were aware of it, and I've read their reports. And they did indeed find some collections of literature and were able to make some chronological statements about it. And that is just fascinating because it tells us about the longevity of literature. For all of the literary texts of antiquity, we have no dates put on them. So you say, well, how do you date them? You date them by what's called paleography, which is to say a very careful examination of the nature of the lettering used. These are all done by hand. And so paleographers talk about the hand of this manuscript or the hand of that manuscript. And they mean simply the visual appearance of the writing or the script in the manuscript. The only kind of texts that have dates are what we call documentary texts. So letters, 
shipping manifests, tax records, things like that, will have dates put on them. And that's a no-brainer. You see, it'll say, you know, the third year of the emperor thus and so, and you go, bingo, we know when that tax record was produced. Those become sort of the, the pegs in the wall on which you say, okay, we have a secure date for that, secure date for that, secure date for that. And then when you come to literary manuscripts, you look at the handwriting and, and basically try to judge what do they most closely resemble? What dated manuscripts do they most closely resemble? So it is a kind of by gosh and by golly uh, exercise, but it is scientific by gosh and by golly exercise. The two things to say about carbon-14 dating, one is that in order to date a manuscript, you have to destroy part of it. You have to take it and burn it. When we're talking about a manuscript that may be 2,000 years old or older, you're loath to destroy any part of it. The second thing is, even if you get the permission to do it, the dating precision of carbon-14 is basically plus or minus 100 years. Well, paleography actually gives you pretty much the same kind of dating. One of the really interesting questions looking at manuscripts is about the length of time of their use. We know with parchment manuscripts that they survive in any decent kind of climate a very long time. But we assume, compared to that, that papyri were quite short-lived, that they were being used, they would wear out. But there are some imponderables for that, aren't there? Because how long a manuscript survives depends partly on how much you use it. If you're a Christian itinerant, preacher going around with a copy of the Gospel of Luke in your pocket, it might wear out more quickly than if you have a copy that's in a building read regularly in Christian worship. One of the things that really interests me though was the discovery that there were whole libraries thrown out at the same time. Archives usually are in reference to business papers, personal letters, and other dated information. It's not literature. So when I refer to libraries, I'm referring to literature. It could be philosophy, it could be a romantic novel, it could be a play. And so what Grinfell and Hunt found on five or six different occasions was a basketful, and in one case literally a basket, the wicker basket itself still intact, containing as many as 20 book rolls of ancient literature that had been thrown out. Now here's where it gets really interesting. If they could do the stratigraphy, what they found was that in a fourth or fifth century layer was a library that had been thrown out made up mostly of books or book rolls dating to the first or second centuries. Now just do the math. That would mean that these book rolls had been read, had remained in use for two or three hundred years before being thrown out. Scholars who study manuscripts are called textual critics. But textual criticism isn't about criticizing the Bible. It's actually the discipline of comparing various manuscripts and identifying errors in the copying of those documents. Textual criticism is not necessarily something new. The Church Fathers performed their own text criticism as early as Irenaeus. We see Irenaeus already talking about what are the best and weightiest manuscripts. And I think it is reassuring that whatever principle of textual criticism you apply, I think we're pretty well convinced that in the majority of cases, we can get back to the original author's language, style, theology, and so on. No two manuscripts are exactly the same. The differences between manuscripts are referred to as textual variants. Those might be everything from spelling errors to entire verses or even whole sets of missing verses. How frequent are these variants? And how serious an obstacle are they to recovering the original text? We have many old manuscripts, some of them quite ancient, but there are textual variants and scribal errors. How significant are these? Some think that it means that we don't actually know what the original text said. I like to think of them in uh, two different categories, meaningful and viable. Is a variant meaningful? That is, does it change the meaning of the text somehow? Is it viable? That is, does it have a possibility or a likelihood of actually representing the original wording? One-fifth of one percent of all textual variants are both meaningful and viable, and approximately 70 percent of them are spelling differences. But there was no dictionary that said, here's how you spell words. In fact, John was a very creative speller. In the space of eight verses in John chapter 9, he spells the exact same verb three different ways in eight verses. The spelling is not an issue that affects anything, really. Magdalen College, Oxford, 
houses one of the oldest fragments of the Greek New Testament in England. It's known as P64. It consists of three small fragments, but their dating has been the source of an enormous amount of controversy. P64 is a series of three fragments, three papyrus fragments, that came to college in 1901. Uh, they were found by an alumnus, Charles Huliot, when he was a missionary in Luxor. And so in 1901, he sent the, the three fragments to us, and they've been here since. When they arrived in college, we brought in a scholar who dated the fragments to fourth century. And that date remains loosely what was hung on the fragments for about 50 years. In the 1950s, Roberts moved that date backwards to 2nd century AD, and the date remains 2nd century AD for the next 50 years or so. And it wasn't until the 90s when a fair bit of controversy and scholarship developed around these fragments. That controversy was, was kicked off by a scholar by the name of Karsten Peter Tiede, who in 1994 published an article that the supposed date of 2nd century AD was actually too late. He moved the date backwards even further to middle of the 1st century, so 70 AD or so. And that caused a great deal of interest and controversy, both within the scholarly field, but also within the public sphere. For the next two or three years, scholarship went back and forth over what the proper dating was. And since then, things have settled down to a degree but the date hung on these fragments is still late second century AD. Dating controversy aside, I mean, these fragments are one of the most treasured items here in college. They're our earliest witness to a manuscript in college, and in fact, in the country. Each year, children from the school across the road, Modern College School, before they go off to the confirmation, they come up here and they, they're, they're shown the fragments. Biblical scholars talk about originals and autographs when discussing the initial copies of the New Testament. Dr. Craig Evans gives us some insight into how letters from the first century were written. The author himself may hold the pen, but usually it was a professional scribe that did the writing. And then the pen was handed to the author who added his name at the very end, and that's why it's called autograph. But there are several important things you need to know about autographs. For one thing, when someone composed a document to send it out, either a letter or a gospel, that wasn't the only copy. A copy was made and then retained, and so in a very real sense there were two autographs, although only one was perhaps signed. We should also assume that in some cases involving letters, multiple copies were made. In other words, there wasn't just one original that was sent out as an autograph to one destination, but there might be three, four, or five. We actually have evidence for that at Qumran, where we have six fragmentary letters, all the same letter found in Cave 4. It's quite possible Ephesians was one of these kinds of letters, multiple copies sent out to different destinations. But why is this important? Well, if there were two originals, one sent, one retained, that greatly increases the chances that one of those autographic texts would have survived for 150 or 200 years and copies were continuously made of it, which had the effect of stabilizing the text. Often a secretary would write out a, a copy of the dictated letter onto wax tablets, then take those tablets, produce the, the actual written letter on whatever surface, whether it be papyrus or parchment, and then probably review that with the original author to make sure it's accurate. There's another thing, too, that we need to know about letters in particular. Paul's letters, for example, where he not only names himself, he will name other people, perhaps at the beginning of his letter or near the end. And what we know from other letters from antiquity is that some letters were, you might say, group letters or group efforts. In other words, it's quite possible that when Paul is dictating a letter to someone like Tertius, who wrote Romans, that he actually handed the pen to some of his other colleagues who composed a paragraph or two. And so we shouldn't assume that Paul's letters are only from Paul himself, but they represent a team effort. One of the striking things about the earliest Christian texts is the form in which they were written. The Codex was the predecessor to our modern book and was popularized by the earliest Christian communities as their preferred way of recording scripture. During the first five centuries of the Christian era, 90% of all Christian books were written on a codex and only 14% of all non-Christian books were written on a codex. So this was the first and probably only time in the history of the church where we were actually ahead of the technological curve. The Christians 
even if they didn't invent the book, at least popularized it and used it for their literary possessions. The construction of a codex was a very labor-intensive process. You're talking about buying a ready-made roll, cutting it up in pre-measured segments, and then stacking them and folding them, and eventually sewing them together into choirs. Those are stacks of sheets put together and folded together, and then you do another choir. Scribes eventually came up with very ingenious ways of sewing those together and putting bindings on them. It was strikingly important to the history of the book because the folded book is how we understand a book today. They prefer the codex, especially for those writings that they seem most to prize, their, their scriptural text. For other texts, they are much freer to use what is the dominant preferred book form of the time, the roll. So let's go to the Gospel of Thomas, for example. We have fragments of three copies of the Gospel of Thomas from the early third century. One of them is a page of a codex, written in an average sort of hand with markings on it to show that it was intended for study purposes. The other one is a miniature roll, probably somebody's portable copy of the Gospel of Thomas that they wanted. And the other one is a reused roll. The point is, they weren't prepared for church usage. Those texts that were prepared for reading in church and that were intended to be treated as scripture by the community are almost entirely written on codexes. So when we talk about copies of texts around at the time, the physical form in which they're put is a significant indicator of the purpose for which they were put. Everybody knows about the King James Version that came out in 1611. What you might not know, though, is that it's based mostly on the text of Stephanus, which was produced in the 16th century. And the text of Stephanus made use of the text of Theodore Bezai, or Codex Bezai. And what you might not know is that text reaches back to the year 400, give or take a decade or two. Codex Bezai also has a Latin text alongside its Greek text, and the Latin text is judged to be reaching back to about the year 200. So here at Cambridge University Library, we have thousands of medieval manuscripts, but the oldest of them is Codex Bezai. So it's a late 4th, early 5th century manuscript. It's a, a manuscript of the Gospels and it also contains the Acts of the Apostles and a fragment of the Third Epistle of John. So Beza was uh, a reformer in Geneva. He was um, pretty much the heir of John Calvin. Uh, after Calvin's death, he basically was the leader of the Reform congregation in Geneva. So this is Beza's letter when he donated Codex Bezae to the University of Cambridge. So it says it's Geneva, it's the 8th of July mm. in the year 1581. Recently, just a couple of years ago, uh, a scholar discovered some notes of one of the King James translators. Um, so we can actually see a little bit about the process by which the translators worked. So this edition of the New Testament is very influential. Um, so this was used by the translators of the King James version of the Bible. Um, so they used Stephanus's edition and studied it carefully. We know it's been here at least 300 years. And these are some photos from the 1960s when the manuscript was taken apart. This is the naked spine of the manuscript. It's a painstaking process rebinding a manuscript. So every single leaf is taken and repaired and it's humidified to relax it and then held under mm. tension. This is what it looked like before the rebind, and you can see all this metal and the, the decoration. So this is the, would have been the university coat of arms. One of the interesting features about Codex Bezae is that it has a unique agraphon. An agraphon, of course, literally means from Greek, agraphon, not written in one of the canonical gospels. And so this, this agraphon is about a man that Jesus observes working on the Sabbath. Now Jesus says, if you know what you're doing, you're blessed, but if you really don't, and you're just disregarding the Sabbath, then you're a transgressor of the law. Now, what is interesting, it's only here in Codex Bezae. So that special reading in Codex Bezae 
is relegated to a footnote on page 237. And I like it, meo vetustissimo, my very old. Yes, yes, yeah, not too many people can say that in a textual apparatus, but there it is, in a footnote. Stephanus, who made use of this text, he read it, he saw it. He knew it couldn't be authentic, but he wanted to put it in a footnote so that other scholars could read it and see it. Some scholars have alleged that the scribes who copied the New Testament changed the text substantially, whether unintentionally or intentionally. Their mistakes obscured the readings of the original text to the point where we no longer know what the original writers wrote in the Gospels. When Bart Ehrman came up with his book, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, and the theory that the text was changed to respond to Christological debates in the 3rd, 4th centuries, he used quite often the idea that scribes changed the text. That's an interesting question which has been given quite a lot of study since then. What did scribes do? I think I would take the point of view that scribes didn't go about changing the text. They were there to produce a copy. Some have, have charged that Christian scribes at first were barely literate, well-meaning Christians and not professional scribes. People often ask questions about how reliable the New Testament is, not just in what it reports, but do we actually even have the New Testament as it was originally written? So some people say, for example, well, there may have been a nice, pristine early version of the Gospel of Mark, but hasn't it been sort of souped up and beefed up over the centuries? Hasn't Jesus been turned uh, from a, an innocent Jewish rabbi into someone who claims to forgive sin? Well, one of the problems with this theory is that we're very, very hard pressed to find any manuscript where we can see that a scribe has, with any consistency at all, changed the text, whether in an orthodox direction or indeed in an unorthodox direction. My name is Georgia Angelopoulos and I'm a calligrapher. My background is Greek, so I am interested in learning all the scripts that were used in the ancient world. So today we're just working on rendering P75, the Gospel of St. John on papyrus. So I'm just working with a cut reed pen, which did come from Greece, and using ink that approximates the kind of carbon ink that would have been used in the period and we're starting with anarchin ino logos geologos in the beginning was the word so just getting a feel for the hand of the piece the speed at which the writing was written when you try copying a hand you notice little things he liked making certain gestures especially with tea this isn't a hand at this stage that is noticeably christian it has its roots in a pagan antiquity we have to remember throughout all our discussions that when we say scribes, we're talking about a body of almost professional copyists. Hack copyists is how T.C. Skeet often referred to them. These were people who weren't necessarily Christians, but they were paid by the line. It was piecework. They actually got paid by the number of lines that they actually copied. And they didn't know what they were writing necessarily. They certainly wouldn't have deliberately changed things in any one particular Christian direction. Let me give an illustration of the kinds of mistakes that you'll get in some of these early manuscripts that are not intentional, but can easily be detected. If someone said to you, well, just as the preamble to the Constitution says, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect onion, you'd say, wait a minute, it's not onion, it's union. You made a mistake. You wrote O instead of U. Anybody would know that. That's not going to be a thing where, gee, did he mean cucumber? You know, <laughs> we know it means union. And so that's the kinds of mistakes we get in these early papyri. And so they're easily fixable. And what happens is the next generation of scribes typically fixes those kinds of just mental farts, if you will. They, they didn't quite get it right and they know what their problem was. The word gospel means good news. In the case of the New Testament, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. But the differences between the Gospel accounts of Jesus have often been pointed to as a reason for not believing the message of Jesus. But the early church recognized the value in having four different perspectives on the life of Christ and bundled these together as the fourfold Gospel. <laughs> 
When I think about the variance among the manuscripts, all of our diverse manuscripts, not just in Greek, but also in Latin and other languages. And when I think of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which share many stories in common, but don't always tell the stories in exactly the same words. I'm reminded of what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 13. He has given them seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. He's asked them if they understand. They assure him that they do. And he said, good because the scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a, like a scholar or a householder who can open up the treasure box, the thesaurus, and reach inside and pull out old stuff and new stuff. In other words, Jesus is telling his disciples, if you really understand what I'm saying, you're better than just a parrot that repeats word for word what I taught. You understand what I taught, and you can adapt it because you're going to have to. You're going to be preaching in contexts where it's a different culture, it's a different language. You have to show me that you understand my words and can apply them in a variety of settings. And invariably, that will create some variations. So in a sense, the manuscripts that we have, the fourfold gospels that we have, hark back to Jesus himself, the way he taught his disciples, the way he instructed them, and the commission that he gave them in teaching the world his teaching. The manuscripts either have a volume that has the four gospels, the four gospel book, the title in the minuscules is typically the Tetra Oyangelion, the number four, but Oyangelion gospel in singular. Hard to translate into English, it's something like the fourfold gospel, or I personally like the term four gospel book. So in the case of the, the Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, this is a kind of summary of what the whole of Mark's Gospel is about. It's good news and it's about Jesus Christ. It's not how to live your life in a moral way. It's not how to vote. Uh, it's, it's about Jesus Christ and, how, and what he's done for us and how to follow him. Similarly, there's a preface at the beginning of Luke's Gospel where Luke reassures the readers this is stuff that he's researched, this is stuff that has really taken place in space-time history. And John's Gospel also has a preface as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But this God from all eternity has become flesh in the land of Israel, in Palestine, in the first century AD. We talk today commonly of four Gospels. In antiquity, in the ancient Christian church, they didn't really talk about four Gospels very much. They talked about one Gospel. And so, when they titled the Gospels, they didn't title it Mark's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, John's Gospel. They called it the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Luke and according to John. And one of the remarkable things about the manuscripts of the New Testament is that there's enormous consistency all the way through. We find hardly any variation at all in what the Gospels are called. They always have these same authors attributed to them. They were never, not, never anonymous, uh, but they always had these same titles inscribed on the manuscripts. Although the vast majority of textual variants are spelling errors or little notations, there are a couple of longer passages that stand out. They're known as the long ending of Mark and the story of the woman caught in adultery. They don't appear in the earliest manuscripts. So, how did they come to be in the New Testament? Now, some, of course, allege that there have been changes in the New Testament text. Well, where are they? There are only two significant alterations or questions that we know of. One of them is the story that's found in John's Gospel between chapters 7 and 8. That's the story about the woman caught in the act of adultery. The other one that's a question and involves 12 verses or so, and that's the ending of Mark. That is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. But isn't it interesting, the only two places where there really is a question is well attested in the manuscript tradition. There's no way that this has slipped under the radar. It's caught. We go back to our earliest text, and the passage in John just isn't there. And scholars note that the language in the passage doesn't really sound much like John's language. And when we look at the ending of Mark, some of the same reservations are registered there too. If we didn't have those two passages, what would we be lacking? The same things that are taught about Jesus, like in the story of the woman caught in adultery, that he forgives sins. 
we see many times in the Gospels. If that were the only place we had him forgiving someone's sins, we'd be in trouble. Mark chapter 2, for example, the, the paralytic who's dropped down through the roof of Peter's house, Jesus tells him your sins are forgiven. So we have those kinds of things. We have parallels of the kind of person that Jesus was already seen elsewhere. And in Mark 16, the kinds of things that Jesus does that we see in that passage really are probably pulled largely from the book of Acts and from Luke and Matthew by somebody in the first half of the second century adding that to Mark's gospel. So there's really nothing lost in that. And so in the two places in 27 books, or a total of about 20,000 lines of Greek text as the whole New Testament would be written out. There are only two passages of any length where there's any doubt, but there is no doubt because the manuscript evidence is so substantial and so early, they, we, we can identify them as, as ringers. They really don't belong in the text. And you could add to that two, maybe three other passages involving one, maybe a verse and a half, two verses at most. And it's the same thing. Text critic great Bruce Metzger remarked there were only 40 lines out of 20,000 where there was any doubt at all about how it should originally read. And those 40 lines don't involve one single significant Christian teaching. The Vatican Library houses one of the most important Christian codices in the world, Codex Vaticanus. Its origins are unknown but many scholars believe it was one of 50 copies of the Bible that the Emperor Constantine commissioned. Codex Vaticanus has been in the Vatican Library since at least the 15th century. It seems to appear in an inventory of the library in, which was made in 1475. We don't know how it came to be here. That's the first news we have of it. Whoever has seen Codex Vaticanus in a in a facsimile edition or so, will be fascinated. It is like the, the Bible as you hope it was when it was old, a really big fat book, you know, that you can go through, you can read easily. There are not that many corrections in it, it just absolutely looks beautiful. When you look closer, you make more discoveries. There are actually notes in there, people have been reading that book, you know, for more than a thousand years and leaving little notes, leaving little thoughts in between the lines at the side. Uh, one user, felt very sorry for the manuscript because the, the ink was fading. So he went through the whole manuscript and rewrote every single letter again with his ink, except those passages that he couldn't find in his Bible. So if you look at Codex Vaticanus today, you can rather quickly just go through it and look for those faded passages. And then you know this is a place where we have probably a very interesting variant. Codex Vaticanus is, is just a fascinating manuscript. We don't really know where it comes from. It just shows up in the 15th century and gets a card in the Vatican Library. We're not sure where it comes from. Looking at the paleography, the way the letters are written, it is usually dated into the fourth century. Many translators have wrestled with choosing the best variant reading for a particular verse. But some scholars have even gone so far as to say that the gospels have been corrupted to the point where we have no idea what the original writers even wrote down. But does the manuscript evidence actually support that claim? You know, the late Helmut Kester, who was an out outstanding scholar at Harvard for uh, decades, one time in one of his publications stated, on the basis of no evidence, it was just an assumption, uh, stated that the, uh, the texts that we have, the manuscripts that we now have, probably don't reflect the originals. That there, there has been a lot of changes that took place in the first century when the Gospels and Paul's letters were first written. In other words, the very first copies, and then the very first copies of the first copies. When these copies were being made in the first century, on in the second, there were all kinds of wild changes made. The evidence simply does not support that assumption. And one of the things that has caused us to doubt that scenario is the discovery that the ancient manuscripts were in use a long time. Because what we have found thanks to archaeology hand in hand with manuscript discovery, we discover that, you know what, manuscripts were in use 200, 300 years or longer. How's this happen? Well, at Oxyrhynchus, where half a million pages of text were recovered in the 1890s on into the 1920s. Well, some stratigraphy was done. And so we have libraries that have been thrown out and we can do chronological study 
of these books. And what we find is that literature typically was in use 150 years to 200 years, sometimes three or 400 years. Now the implications for the New Testament are obvious. If Paul wrote his letters in the 50s and 60s, if the gospel writers wrote their gospels in the 60s and 70s of the first century, and the autographs remained in use for 150 years, that takes us all the way into the early third century. We have continuity from the autographs to these early copies we have. And those early copies would have had the same duration, the same longevity, which takes us right into the fourth century where we have the complete Greek New Testament, like Codex Vaticanus or Codex Sinaiticus. And when those were written, these other papyri that you can now see in Geneva or in Dublin or wherever, they were still in existence. And so this idea that, oh, well, who knows what Paul originally wrote in his letters or who knows what the gospel writers originally said about Jesus, there's no foundation for that kind of skepticism. This has been commented on. Fred Wissey, longtime professor at Yale, remarked one time that the stability of the Greek New Testament text is such that he considered it nothing less than a miracle. I thought that was an interesting thing because there was, he wasn't being pious or theological. No intended apologetic there in his observation. But he ought to know because as a scholar of Coptic Gnostic texts, he knew what instability was all about. The early church faced numerous challenges from groups who wanted to put their spin on the gospel. One of these groups called themselves Gnostics, which means knowledge. They produced gospels that were attributed to the apostles, but contained what they believed were special insights into the nature of reality. Now we refer to certain groups in early Christianity and certain texts sometimes as Gnostic or representing Gnosticism. This has a, become an increasingly controversial and woolly term. But I think mainly what we're talking about, uh, if I could say that the, the hardcore example of Gnosticism, is people who believed that there was a, a high good God and uh, an inferior evil God. And they tended to think that the world was actually made by the evil God. It's part of the reason why, in all of the Christian creeds from the Apostles' Creed onward, the very first thing that you say is, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. They would produce sometimes some very odd counter-readings of, of scriptural texts. So one of the earliest people to comment on this is Irenaeus, who was a bishop in Lyon in France in the 170s and 180s AD. One of the first things he comments at about an apocryphal gospel is about the, the gospel of truth. The thing that Irenaeus says about this is the ink is still wet on the manuscript of the gospel of truth that uh, Irenaeus got hold of. It wasn't written uh, in the apostolic age. It didn't have the ancient credentials that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John had. Another church father, Eusebius, often talks about apocryphal texts as well. And one of the things that he caught says is that they clearly weren't written by the apostles that they claim to have been written by. So uh, Eusebius calls some of these texts bastards, uh, illegitimate children, uh, because they don't have the parents that they claim to have. The Vatican Library also houses another ancient manuscript, P75. Its reading bears a striking resemblance to the famous Codex Vaticanus and is one of the most significant and studied manuscripts by scholars throughout the world. What I like about P75 is that, that it's a text from the early third century that reads almost identically to the great Codex Vaticanus, which dates to a hundred years later. So here's an early papyrus written perhaps when the autographs and early copies were still in circulation. P75 was discovered in the sands of Egypt in the 1950s. Now it resides in the Vatican Library. It has a very beautiful script. It was clearly the hand of a trained scribe, and he did his work very well. This is also the earliest papyrus that has more than one book of the Bible on the same page. It features the end of Luke, then the title and the beginning of the Gospel of John, making it the earliest testimony to the developing canon of the New Testament. The outer pages are lost. But we can, because we have the middle sheet and we have the page numbers, reconstruct the contents and we can be absolutely sure that it started with Luke on page one and was followed by John. This is not a four gospel book, it just had these two. The question that 
been asked in recent years very strongly by an Australian scholar called Brent Nongbury, how do we go about dating these things? And he said the first rule has to be we work with manuscripts that can be dated to date undateable manuscripts. He started to look around for documents which can be dated to a certain period of time and looked for the ones which were closest in appearance to P66. And the one he came up with contains an account of the martyrdom of somebody who was martyred in the beginning of the fourth century. So we have something arguably copied not about 200, but probably around about the same time as Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Since then, um, Nongbri has turned his attention to P75, and again, his arguments finds the closest analogies in the fourth century. And I think that's one of the main challenges facing the study of New Testament manuscripts for the next generation. So in response to Nongbri's argument that P75 could be 4th century, I'd, I'd say that's perfectly possible. However, there is a structural weakness in his argument, which is he actually uses the resemblance between Vaticanus and P75 as an argument for putting P75 late. Here this manuscript is early 3rd century and Codex Vaticanus, mid 4th century, has a text that's almost identical to it, except in places when it disagrees, Vaticanus often, if not usually, goes back to a much earlier text. Those two manuscripts together tell us that we have a text that is a very pure tradition going back very, very early. Often the keenest insights come at the intersection between two different disciplines. In this case, Dr. Craig Evans presented groundbreaking research at the intersection of archaeology and New Testament studies in a paper documenting the length of time that manuscripts were used in the ancient world. Well, not too many years ago, a classicist named George Houston investigated Roman libraries, Greco-Roman libraries from antiquity. And one of the things he was interested in was this question, how long were literary book rolls in use before being discarded? And he discovered that most literature was in use for 150 to 200 years, and in some cases, even three or four centuries. It's a fascinating study, but he didn't say anything about biblical literature. So we need to investigate that. And what we find at Qumran, scrolls, Bible scrolls, were in use for 200 years or more when the Qumran community came to a sudden end. Which means those scrolls hadn't even been retired yet. How long would they have been used? Then you, then you think of some of the great Christian codices like Codex Bizi or Vaticanus. And these codices were in use hundreds of years before they were retired. And so if we apply these observations to the ancient Christian writings, the first papyrus books of scripture that Christians produced, dating back to 200, like P66 and P45, we have to wonder when those were written out by scribes in the year 200 or whenever, we have to realize that some of the originals of the New Testament, what we call autographs, may well have still been in circulation. And of course, their very first copies made in the first century could still be in circulation. So if the observations of Grinfell and Hunt more than 100 years ago, or Professor Houston in more recent years, if those observations are applied to New Testament scriptures, then there's a possibility that we have this continuity from the original text to what we now have in our museums and libraries today, like P45, P66, P75, and others, and a continuity between them and the great codices like Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which contain the entire Bible, the complete New Testament as well as the Old Testament. So what it suggests is there really isn't any room for the idea of these theories that there have been wild, crazy changes made or that there are so many errors or so much corruption in the text, we really don't know what it originally said. The evidence strongly suggests otherwise. The evidence suggests that the Bible that we have now is the same as the Bible when it was originally produced long ago. Some scholars have proposed that the New Testament writings were deliberately altered by church leaders or those desiring to consolidate power. 
so that the writings themselves are so corrupt that there is no way of knowing what the original writers wrote and that the stories of the Gospels simply cannot be trusted. When people make the assertion that people have deliberately falsified the New Testament text and changed it, I think there are some logistical challenges to this idea. So if we just start with the four Gospels, what we find is that at first, each of the four Gospels is written in separate places, but fairly early on people begin to transmit the four Gospels as a group, which means that effectively you have the Gospels being transmitted in two different media. One is singly and the other is as a group. So of course if you're going to change Gospels, you need to change them in both of those media. Now, you could say that they were changed very early on. The problem with this is, the earlier you make that sort of change go on, the less likely it is that anyone knew that one of those Gospels was going to become part of the four Gospels, part of the New Testament, part of the Bible, part of something so substantial. So in fact, the motivation for changing something in order to produce an effect is taken away because people don't know that it would have the effect. And even then, you might be able to change one Gospel and the one that's in your locality, but you wouldn't know about the other three. Let's say you're in the year 100, let's say all four Gospels have been written. You don't know that there are going to be four Gospels to go and change all four of them. So there are these problems when you try and locate a period when someone could have changed all four Gospels. I want to know when is it? Is it the year 100, 110, 120? It just give me the period. because. Whenever you make that claim, I'm going to find difficulties. If you start saying someone was changing the Gospels around the year 160, then I'm going to have the problem uh, that, well, the Gospels have been spreading for quite some time by now. Um, there's a full Gospel collection, but also Gospels are being transmitted individually. H are you going to change both of those? By the year 170, 180, we start getting um, the Gospels being transmitted probably in Syriac, in the Diatessaron. So that becomes difficult. By the year 200, we probably have the Gospels being transmitted in Latin in North Africa. Certainly by the year 300, we'd have it in Coptic as well. And so you start asking the question, when could someone actually change all four Gospels? Now we know that there are a couple of passages which have significant additions to the earliest text. One is at the end of Mark, and another is this woman caught in adultery. Those cases really are unique because the great thing is that the early versions often omit those things, or they show some omission and some with them present. In a sense, if someone tries to do anything, you get this mess of evidence. And that's great, because uh, that shows you there's been no conspiracy to try and make all the evidence look the same. It also gives you a lot more certainty about all of the other passages, because you know that if someone had tampered, you would get that sort of pattern showing up, the fact that the pattern doesn't show up. So I'd want to say that really throughout the whole of history, there's never been an individual who's been in a position to make deliberate substantial changes across the New Testament. There's never been an emperor, there's never been a pope, there's never been anyone who's been in a position to do that. And of course, when you go to the Middle Ages, there are so many different translations that logistics of just going around and changing them all would just be phenomenal. When we talk about the New Testament canon, we really need to address a popular myth. And the myth is that the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, in conjunction with the Council of Nicaea, the very famous council in church history, picked the books that were going to be in the New Testament. Now this idea was popularized through the novel by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, you'll see it picked up on any number of internet sites. And there's just one little problem. It just isn't true. And we know it's not true because we have the decisions that were made at the Council of Nicaea. They were written down, they are codified, they're referred to as the Canons of Nicaea. You could actually go look those up on the internet and see that the Council did not make any decision about which books belong in the New Testament, nor did Constantine dictate that that be done. Canon comes from the term cane, which was a measuring stick or a reed. It just refers to a rule or standard by which other things are measured. So I think we need to, again, consider that sort of thing when we talk about the New Testament canon. Now, there are a number of places where scholars will try to say, aha, this proves that the ancient church changed the, the uh, text to affirm the deity of Christ and uh, other things like that. And Bart Ehrman, in his book, Misquoting Jesus, leads you down the path of suggesting that very thing. 
But in the paperback edition that came out a few months after his uh, hardbound edition came out in 2005, uh, the uh, publishers apparently wanted to keep the sales going, so they added an appendix. And on page 252 in this appendix, they asked him, so why do you disagree with your mentor, Dr. Bruce Metzger at Princeton Seminary, about the, the nature of these variants? Because he says no essential doctrine is affected by any of these viable variants, and you're saying that they do change doctrine. His response is no cardinal doctrine, no essential doctrine is affected by any of these variants. Now that's remarkable. Even the publishers themselves had misread what Bart Ehrman said in that book. And even Bart Ehrman, when he was interviewed, said, oh yeah, the, do the doctrine of the New Testament is changed by these variants. He couldn't prove it though. And here in a moment of honesty and openness, he had to admit no essential doctrine is affected. Tens of thousands of people have abandoned the Christian faith because of Bart Ehrman's writings and misquoting Jesus. I've used that quotation in all three debates I've had with him, and that's how I closed the debate. And it's irrefutable because he's the one who said it, and all I can say to that is, Amen. You're right. In Manchester, England, the John Rylands Library houses the most ancient fragment of the New Testament extant today. It's known as P-52, no bigger than the size of a credit card. When it was discovered, P-52 rocked the world of biblical scholarship. It's been here since 1920. It was part of a collection of fragments that were brought over from Egypt by Bernard Grenfell. It was only in the 1930s that the collection was being catalogued by Colin Roberts and this particular piece, he recognized its significance immediately. So here he sees this manuscript written on both sides and then he starts to transcribe it. What it is on, on the first side is John 18 verses 31 through 33. On the back side, it was John 18, 37 and 38. And he sent photographs of it to the three leading papyrologists in Europe at the time. Each one wrote back to him independently and said, this manuscript cannot be dated later than 150 and should be dated as early as 100. A fourth, a German scholar, demurred and said, no, I think it may have been written in the 90s. Well, John's gospel at this time was typically dated as late as 170 by F.C. Bauer, who had lived 90 years early and had published on this. Bauer was a professor at Tübingen University. He had studied under he Hegel, and you may not know that, that term Hegelian dialectic, but it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And what he argued was that you have uh, Peter's version of Christianity as thesis, Paul's version, which includes the Gentiles, as antithesis, and then John's and the book of Acts as synthesis. And the way he came up to his synthesis, purely on the basis of philosophical constructs, is that John's gospel cannot be dated any earlier than 160 and should be dated about 170. Now, here's an ounce of evidence that destroys a pound of presupposition. It sent two tons of German scholarship to the flames. Most people who study the subject still regard P52 here as the, the earliest piece of New Testament in the world. Before it was on permanent exhibition, we would bring it out for people. And it was really interesting to observe their responses to it. People would often get very emotional in front of it. They would want to touch it, kiss it in some cases, understandably want to pray uh, in front of it. So it has a status, almost a relic. It has that significance beyond the physical entity and beyond the text that it contains. Could it be possible that when this papyrus was written, the autographs, the originals, and early copies were still in circulation? Seems hard to believe, but you know, there were some early church fathers who thought so. Tertullian, for example, writing in about the year 190, responding to heretics who had mutilated Paul's letters, changing the wording, he said, look, it reads this way, and you can see his letters, and he's referring to the autographs, the originals, and he actually names the cities where they are located, six or seven of Paul's letters. The original still in existence at the end of the second century. The church father, Bishop Peter, says the same thing about the Gospel of John. The original is still at Ephesus where the faithful kiss it. So this means the burden of proof has shifted away from those who say the text is stable. 
The burden now rests heavily on those who say we shouldn't trust the text. The text has been changed and therefore we might never know what the text originally showed. What we are really at issue about is not whether we can recover the New Testament, but whether what we have in our printed text is exactly what the New Testament authors originally said. And I would say we can have a great deal of confidence that we have the original wording on the printed page of a Greek New Testament. It's either in the text or it's in the footnotes. We know what Paul said. We know what the rest of the writers of the New Testament wrote because of this vast amount of great manuscript evidence we have from early on through the centuries. We've traveled throughout Europe. We've visited museums, libraries. We've looked at the oldest manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. We have spoken to the curators who protect them. We have interviewed scholars who study them. And we've asked them all, how good are these manuscripts? And what we've been told is that they're very old. They get very close to the originals. And what was very exciting, they preserve the text of the originals. So when you read the New Testament, your translation of the Greek manuscript, you should know that what you have is what they originally said. You have every confidence in reading the New Testament to know that that is indeed what the original author said. I think you really are reading the Word of God. So the next time you read the stories of Jesus, remember the incredible body of evidence inscribed on these fragments.